Good evening. On behalf of Columbia University's Institute of Latin American Studies and the Cuba program, we welcome you to tonight's webinar entitled Update Current Trends in the Arts in Cuba. We are going to have a slight experiment this evening. We're going to begin with a very short uh, documentary on Nancy Morejon, who we worked on linking her up until three o'clock today after several weeks of trying. And unfortunately, her computer would not cooperate. So we're going to show you a very brief snip of a documentary that you can see the full documentary on YouTube. Nancy, as no doubt most of you know, is a Cuban poet, critic, and essayist. She graduated with honors from the University of Havana, having studied Caribbean and French literature. Her work has focused on the mythology of the Cuban nation and the relation of the Black people of Cuba within that nation. She also expresses an integrationist stance in which Spanish and African cultures fuse to make a new Cuban identity. In addition, she is also, she also describes the situation of women within her society, expressing concern for women's experience and for racial equality within the Cuban revolution. Our second speaker will be Angela Rojas. Angela, Angela is currently the Edward LaRoque Tinker Visiting Professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation and a consultant professor at the School of Architecture in Havana, Cuba, as well as a member of the Cuban National Landmark Commissions. She graduated in architecture from the University of Havana and as an urban planner also from the University of Havana and received her doctorate in urban preservation also from the University of Havana. She was a scholar at the Getty Conservation Institute in Los Angeles, California during the fall of 2016. Her research work has focused on the history of architecture, urbanism and cultural heritage, capacity building, rehabilitation of traditional neighborhoods and cultural roots. She is going to speak about trends in architecture in Cuba. Our final speaker will be Sandra Levinson, who is the director of the Center for Cuban Studies and founder and curator of the Cuban art space in New York City. She graduated from the University of Iowa and attended the University of Manchester as a Fulbright Scholar. In addition, she attended Stanford University for her master's and doctoral studies. She has visited Cuba some 300 times and she has been published in several collections on Cuba, including the Cuba Re Reader, The Making of a Revolutionary Society, a contemporary Cuba Re Reader, The Revolution Under Raul Castro, and the Cuba Reader, History, Culture, Politics. She is also the curator of 10,000 Cuban works of arts, including sculptures and painting that are held at the Cuban art space here in New York in Dumbo. We will first see the very short documentary concerning Nancy Morejon, and then Ana Rojas will speak about trends in architecture, and we will finish with a very substantial talk by Sandra Levinson on trends in painting and poster art, as well as other art forms in Cuba. We will not have a question and answer uh, this evening, precisely because we have a very packed schedule. So let us begin with the short documentary on Nancy 
All right, home. Astrid. Para mí, la más importante poeta afrodescendiente de lengua española contemporánea. Francis marca realmente un momento tan importante como puede haber sido el de Nicolás Guillén. Todos los homenajes que ha recibido a nivel nacional e internacional son más que merecidos. Porque su poesía ha sabido escoger de ella lo primordial, aquello que trasciende, aquello que, que puede conmover a cualquier ser humano, esté donde esté. Y ya, modupe. Aquí está mi yo, está mi historia. Yo no hubiera podido escribir todo lo que he escrito si yo creo que no, no hubiera estado aquí. Mujer negra. Todavía huelo la espuma del mar que me hicieron atravesar. La noche no puedo recordarla, ni el mismo océano podría recordarla. Pero no olvido al primer alcatraz que divisé. Altas las nubes como inocentes testigos presenciales. ¿Acaso no he olvidado ni mi costa perdida ni mi lengua ancestral? Me dejaron aquí y aquí he vivido. Y porque trabajé como una bestia, aquí volví a nacer. ¿A cuánta epopeya mandinga intenté recurrir? Me rebelé. Su merced me compró en una plaza. Bordé la casaca de su merced y un hijo macho le parí. Mi hijo no tuvo nombre y su merced murió a manos de un impecable Lord inglés. Anduve. Esta es la tierra donde padecí boca abajo y azotes. Bogué a lo largo de todos los ríos. Bajo su sol sembré, recolecté y las cosechas no comí. Por casa tuve un barracón. Yo misma traje piedras para edificarlo, pero canté al natural compás de los pájaros nacionales. Me sublevé. En esta misma tierra toqué la sangre húmeda y los huesos podridos de muchos otros, traídos a ella o no, igual que yo. Ya nunca más imaginé el camino a Guinea. Era a Guinea, a Benín, era a Madagascar o a Cabo Verde. Trabajé mucho más. Fundé mejor mi canto milenario y mi esperanza. Aquí construí mi mundo. Me fui al monte. Mi real independencia fue el palenque y cabalgué entre las tropas de Maceo. Solo un siglo más tarde, junto a mis descendientes, desde una azul montaña, bajé de la sierra para acabar con capitales y usureros con generales y burgueses. Ahora soy, solo hoy tenemos y creamos. Nada nos es ajeno. Nuestra la tierra, nuestros el mar y el cielo, nuestras la magia y la quimera. Iguales míos, aquí los veo bailar alrededor del árbol que plantamos para el comunismo. Su pródiga madera ya resuena. Dime 
vuelve después Busco el amor pero se esconde oh, no es El proceso de Nancy ha sido desde el principio partiendo de ella, de sí misma, de sus contextos, de su realidad, pero tratando de profundizar en ellos para alcanzar una universalidad. ¿Hasta dónde va a poder llegar con ese talento, con esa inspiración, con ese amor a lo que les rodea, con esa lucidez, esa percepción que ella tiene de los sitios, de los personajes, de, de, de la historia propia nuestra? Son eh, temas que no se habían tratado antes de esta manera o que no se habían tratado algunos ni siquiera, y mucho más visto desde la, de la, desde la óptica de una mujer negra. A partir del 59 es que surge la primera gran generación de escritores afrodescendientes que desde adentro tratan de llevar a la literatura nuestra ese aspecto que era como el lado oculto de la luna, sin autoexotismo. Y Nancy es uno de esos ejemplos. Ahí está su poema eh, acerca de la familia, de su madre, de su abuela, de su padre. Esa cosmovisión de la cubanía profunda es uno de los grandes aportes que ha hecho Nancy, en primer lugar como mujer, como poeta, como mujer negra de origen popular, que ha entrado, no con mucha facilidad, pero ha logrado violentar las puertas de esos arcanos tan selectivos de la literatura escrita en nuestros países de América. Mi madre no tuvo jardín, sino islas acantiladas flotando bajo el sol en sus corales delicados. No hubo una rama limpia en su pupila, sino muchos jarrotes. Qué tiempo aquel cuando corría descalza sobre la cal de los orfelinatos y no sabía reír y no podía siquiera mirar el horizonte. Ella no tuvo el aposento de marfil, ni la sala de mimbre, ni el vitral silencioso del trópico. Mi madre tuvo el canto y el pañuelo para acunar la fe de mis entrañas, para alzar su cabeza de reina desoída y dejarnos sus manos como piedras preciosas frente a los restos fríos del enemigo. Y ya modupe fobae. Y ya modupe fobae. Your uh, try to unmute. See if that unmute works. How's that? There we go. Okay. <laughs> we'll now hear from Angela Rojas, who will talk about trends in Cuban architecture. Thank you. I'll we'll put you to work. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. First, I want to thank Michael Crahan and ELS Institute of Latin American Studies and of course, Columbia University for this invitation to share uh, this very important webinar with uh, colleagues at such as Nancy Marajon and Sandra Lepso, and of course, Meg. Well, uh, in the case of architecture, it is a bit difficult to explain the, or to identify different trends. At the beginning of the 20th century, eclectic architecture, I mean, Mozart architecture, neoclassical the styles, there were different trends, very well characterized by the, what Alejo Carpentier called the uh, dance of uh, styles and uh, there you could see different possibilities, different trends, precisely 
based on the interest by the authors. That happened again uh, during the 20s and 30s that you could, could design buildings, but you know, the, the architect then, design buildings with different style being the same building, I mean, the same function, but with different uh, expressions or the same expression with different functions as this case. So we had there, then also uh, again, architecture, outdoor architecture, and the possibility to uh, search, to identify the author with a particular style. During the 40s and the 50s, modern architecture really very much influenced by American architecture had mostly uh, showed the international style, the modern movement, and even the work from important architects. In the case, for instance, the Havana Hilton, uh, designed by, by Welton Beckett and Cuban architects, and two Cuban architects, or the Richard Neutra Schultz's house in Havana. They were, both of them were, well, had their style, modern movement from the 50s style. At the beginning of the revolution, there were different trends in Cuba revolutionary architecture. These are two important masterpieces with different approaches. Uh, the National School of Arts by Pozio Garate and Gotardi is, is probably the most famous building built during revolution, human revolution. And of course, its trend is the organic architecture. And the other uh, image is Kuhai, the uh, Technological University of Havana that this has been made following the brutalism trend, mostly the British brutalism trend. But what happens with current trends? Now, it's more difficult to analyze or to identify different trends in architecture. Why? Because new architecture is very, it's just a few buildings that are built by uh, the state. And the most important trend is not new architecture. From my point of view, the most important trend in Cuba is preservation. Preservation on the architectural scale, but also preservation of landscape, preservation of cities, preservation of the territory. So, but that is not new architecture. So uh, we have this uh, approach, this trend as a paradigmatic trend, the most successful, I, I think, in Cuban architecture, but it's not new architecture, it's preservation. So new architecture, we can identify it mainly in the case of the new hotels. New hotels that are have the particularity of being in author's architecture. I mean, it, they are inspired by international trends as a, a author's architecture, but at the same time, they are not a author's architecture in Cuba because they are anonymous. And the concept is mostly uh, brought by uh, uh, decision makers and investors, not by the architects. So those buildings, well, we Cuban architects are not, don't agree with those uh, hotels that they are, they change the skyline, skyline of the city and, and they, are, they are based on uh, today's international style. And some of them are very <laughs> dramatic in, in their shape. And some of them are uh, even in effect the context, the skyline, etc. 
uh, this one that is in a very important place in Old Havana. And this one in Old Havana too, that is something that uh, is an aggression to the cortex. Or this one, a beautiful gallery that has been transformed in a really international Latin identity gallery and hotel. Uh, well, there are uh, two cases that are not absolutely uh, good, absolute, absolutely correct. Uh, the case of the International Hotel in Baradero Beach, it was a very beautiful, was a very beautiful modern hotel from the late uh, 40s in Baradero. It has been, sorry, it has been demolished in 2008 and changed for a very big elephantiasic hotel following well, concepts really not updated. Or the case, the case of this tower in Havana, close to Coppelia. Coppelia is a very famous important uh, architectural work in El Vedado in Havana. And this tower, the tower uh, at K Street, dam, the skyline competes with the Havana Libre and with the towers of a, of a church. And well, it has been the, uh, uh, the two of them, the International in the new International and the Tower of K are really great mistakes. But again, preservation. Preservation as the successful and important trend and paradigmatic example to follow. This is a hotel in Old Havana that was, has been preserved, has been rehabilitated, restored, and new architecture in, inside it is a very nice, harmonic, and um, beautiful architecture. Another trend, the eternal kitsch. Well, since the state doesn't build many buildings, most of the houses are uh, restored, not restored, are transformed by the owners or built by the owner with, without architects. And the kitsch, the looking for identity, but identity in architecture is very difficult to find. So we have first, well, uh, as part of the eternal kitsch, we have the ranchon. The ranchon is a well, it's a hut uh, similar to the traditional boyo, and from, uh, usually it has it is used in the countryside. But the problem is when, when the ranchon is used in the city, in urban urbanized uh, places. Or the quiche, for instance, this is a quiche scenography, decoration at the Cuban Air, Havana Airport. I, I don't have to explain it, but the Havana Airport is a very important work from one of the important uh, Cuban architects, and it has been changed with this uh, decoration or the use of color, this is a trend, the use of colors, colors that doesn't have anything to do with the type of the house, or the famous balustrades that are all Cuba, some of them, well, of course, kitschy, and some of them really are jokes, not intended jokes. But I want to be optimistic, I want to, think that everything will be following the real uh, and fantastic trend of preservation. And there are some examples, really, unfortunately, <coughs> sorry, they are just a few, but they are important. For instance, this office in El Vedado by a team of young architects 
or this one is a restaurant and cafeteria in El Vedado. They, they choose the white color. I mean, I don't know why, but I, I, I don't agree very much with using of the white color. But anyway, they are okay. They are respectful and they are nice and they were, are well designed. There are other experiences. This is West, just one of them. They are not many, but they are very interesting. And I think that they are trends, positive trends. For instance, this place that has been painted by one of the persons who live there, uh, one of the artists. And it's a positive approach to the intention of folklorization of urban space. So this is a very important case and well, I don't admire it. But again, rehabilitation, preservation, this is an example that everybody loves. It's a, a fabrica de art, I mean the factory of art. It has been, it was a building, a factory, a factory that produced oil, uh, well, decades ago, but then it has been transformed by a team of young architects led by Ernesto Jimenez and others for a place, for a, a venue for different uh, lectures and, and even in parties and exhibitions and whatever. And it's really something fantastic. Or this case this is a museum, a car museum in Old Havana, where you can find the famous Cadillacs and Chevrolets and so. And it's really very simple, very humble. Its name is El Garaje, just plain. El Garaje, it means the garage. Uh, and that is the, its simplicity part of the intention of the architects and it's really fantastic. Or this case is the Hidalgo de Cavieres uh, Center in Old Havana too. I'm coming back to, to heritage because I think I, I, I really am sure that is the most important uh, activity, architectural activity in Cuba uh, currently. Uh, and then this is a, it was a place that the reason was to move there a mural that was in a hotel. Well, I don't agree with moving the mural, but anyway, once it has been moved, it was fantastic. The place they designed, young architects again designed for uh, showing the mural in Old Hawaii. Well, this is part of that really, it's really small. Or this, this one, the workshop, uh, Atelier Roberto Botardi in Old Havana too is a place for exhibition, for courses, for, well, exhibition courses mainly for teaching, preservation, and so. And it is preservation, but at the same time, it's a new, it's new architecture. Uh, this is an example I, lo I really love. It's a restaurant in Viñales Valley. It was a house uh, from the 19th century, a vernacular but really big and wide house. It has been transformed in a restaurant on a very contemporary way, but keeping the most important attributes of the space and the house. Or what it has been done in my Matanzas in the uh, regarding reanimation, reanimation of the uh, river walk <coughs> and the neighborhood close to the river, next to the river walk, using well, uh, giving a lot of artists to the opportunity to, to create and put their their sculptures. And it's a very, well, people in Matanzas is really happy with it. But I want to 
finish with what is my most important uh, reason <laughs> to, uh, to say uh, that I am optimist. The work, two works from my students at the School of Architecture of Havana. Again, preservation. This is a building restored and a it transformed with this element over there for a social function. And this one is an exhibition building as an infill in Old Havana. And the same, very coherent. The facade are harmonizing with the context with Old Havana. This is on the World Heritage list. But then the interiors are well, uh, are open to imagination and to use of new forms. So I finish here. Thank you very much. And well, until the next one. We will now have a short break. <laughs> Don't go away while we upload the next PowerPoint, which will be presented by Sandra Levinson from the collection of the Cuban art space here in New York, which holds uh, 10,000 pieces. We will not be showing you 10,000 pieces, but we will be showing you a very extensive overview of the um, collection. So we will now upload that. And okay. Yep. We're ready. It's all yours. Now I can get in there. Yeah. Here, where's the arrow? It's this one. Okay. It's right next to this zero. Okay. Right to the left of the zero. Can they hear me? Pardon? Can they hear me? Yeah. We can hear you, but we can't see the presentation. Oh, oh you can't see the presentation. <laughs> okay, Astrid. Help. Go, make sure, go back to your Zoom screen and hit share screen just like we did right before. Okay. Can you move back? Thank you. So I'll have to. All right. How are we going to do this? Go back to where you can see me and Angela, and then the good little green button at the bottom. I'm looking for it. <laughs> it's not showing up. There are no button. There are no icon icons on the bottom. Yep. Go back to where we were originally, where you can see me, Angela, and yourself on the Zoom screen. No. It's not, I'm going to have to go escape and then come back. Or you're going to have to take over. Okay. Can you do that, Esther? Yep. Okay. One second. All right. So I'm back to share. Do you see where it says share screen or would you like me to? Let's see. I'm looking for the little green thing. And I don't There's see it amongst my icons. It should be on the Zoom. You need to go back to the Zoom screen where you can see all of us. Okay. 
I'm going to suggest Astrid that you take over. Okay. Then I'll need someone to just tell me when to advance then. I will. Okay. Yeah. You'll raise your finger. I can advance them. If you, isn't no, it? no, but she, she's going to take oh. over. You won't be able to. Oh, okay. You'll have to indicate or just say to ask. Yeah. Just tell me next slide. That might will be easiest. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So are you going to take over? Yep. What do you want me to do? There you go. Are you ready, Astrid? This uh, the screen should be up with the presentation. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now you, Astrid, you take over, and um, Sandra will say next when she wants to change. Okay. okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Or okay. you can just keep running them. <laughs> I'd rather talk about architecture. <laughs> can you hear me? I don't think anybody can hear me. Yes, now. we can hear you. Okay, I said I'd rather talk about architecture with Angela. <laughs> well, if there's time at the end. <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask one little question, may I? Um, Angela, uh, you commented on um, not liking the white, which I agree with you, but there's this one um, center of about four blocks in uh, Camagüey or Cienfue Cienfuegos where they put together um, a film presentation to make it look really like Hollywood or Los Angeles. Do you know that? Everything is white with big posters of movies and um, of famous stars, both in Cuba and abroad. Do you know that that three or four block area? Sorry, that is in Camagüey, not in Cienfuegos. Yeah. That has, they, they have even a restaurant, a place uh, similar to the Rick's Cafe in Casablanca. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but this it is it, it's, it's a bit funny because it's close it's next to a very important movie theater built at the beginning of revolution that is really fantastic so i uh, i don't blame them them because they were inspired on that building to design the wicks cafe in Camagüey and so and mafia's cafe and so Yes, yes, it's quite surprising. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Well, thank you. I, I really wanted to be an architect instead of an academic, but I was just on my way to get my architecture badge in Girl Scouts, and I got thrown out of my Girl <laughs> Scout troop for talking back to the leader. So I, I never got my architecture badge or studied architecture, but I thought you were terrific. Okay, now I have to talk. <laughs> um, okay, you can put up uh, one of these awful screenshots. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to apologize because I am not an art critic. I never wanted to be an art critic. I wanted to know artists. I love art and when I went to Cuba, it was really the first time that I was exposed to so much art. And, you know, in Cuba, they, they say, well, there's a poet or an artist or a film director born every minute. I think it's probably more like every second. And I think that when we talk about the art in Cuba, the generation of Cuban artists that we're talking about, I think are probably uh, the most recognized of any generation. They're the most worldly. They're, um, they know the most about art, not, not only because they might've gone to one of the, the very wonderful schools that have been opened and especially ISA, the Instituto Superior del Arte that Angela talked about also. 
um, but because they live in a revolution. And what I wanna talk about is how that revolution has affected the art that is made in Cuba. Um, the revolution caused a huge change in the arts, um, in part because you know, when we talk about artists as superstars equal to musicians and sports figures, um, that's one thing. But the artists really became the music, the appearance, the message of the revolution. At the very beginning, it was clear that what was about to happen was that somehow the revolution would bring those artists to the fore and every aspect of the visual arts and the way in which the artists search for their own identity, I think is inextricably bound up with the revolution in those early years. Newsweek once called um, Cuba socialism with salsa. And that was the Cuba I first met in 1969 while Fidel Castro and his compañeros were the socialism, the artists, the writers and dancers were the salsa. Are you, are you gonna change this Astrid or should I? No, you can't do that. Oh, Just okay. Answer. Changing, but I'm changing, but I'm waiting you for you to tell me which one next. So you tell me how's best. Just the next one, the next one. I mean, I don't this see is the it. next one. Yeah, just the next one. Thank you, I'm sorry, I haven't worked with PowerPoint before. It's um, the wrong way. It's vertical and it should be horizontal. I unfortunately and have it, it this way. And it was horizontal on the original. So Give me can you make second. it horizontal? I'm flip it. You can't flip have, it? Give me one second, please. Okay. I downloaded and that's how it showed up. So give me one second. Maybe everything's <laughs> vertical instead of horizontal. No, it should show up. Give me one second. Okay. Um, I'm gonna, there we go. Give me one second. Sorry, give me one second. I have it up and it's not showing. <laughs> it's not showing. It came up fine before and on the side it's right. Can you see it now? I can't see it, no. Give me two seconds to do this. Something's going on with my <laughs> computer. Meg, maybe we can take a quick pause. I don't know why it's not exiting out. Gosh. You can't see any of my screen? Oh, I can see the words. I don't see any. Um... Can you see okay. this now? Yes, it's fine now. Here we go. Okay. There. Okay. Um, this was the first uh, government poster put out by the revolution, Cuando Yo Sea Grande, and spoke about the future. It spoke about what the revolution hoped to give to every child in the country. Next. You can go to the next one. One of the first efforts made in order to fulfill that dream of Cuando Yo Sea Grande 
was, of course, the literacy campaign, which brought thousands of school kids and thousands of teachers, too, into the countryside, into parts of the city where people were still illiterate. And this is the wonderful photograph by Maito Mario Coyula of a young boy teaching an elderly gentleman to read. And that was really the message of the literacy campaign, each one teach one. Next. Next. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. Um, at the same time, um, Cuba was passionate about something that I think we in this country became passionate about only in the last 10 years. And that was saving, recycling the anything that could be saved and reused. You couldn't get a bottle of cola without bringing your old bottle in order to buy a new bottle of cola. And at the same time, the graphic arts, especially posters, were used for teaching all of the lessons that the revolution wanted to instill in people, not just recycling and saving and saving on water, but in this, in this graphic that you see now, making sure that people realize that work was important, that one should not be absent from work. Next one. Next. Um, this was, uh, these are posters about agriculture, obviously, the Zafra, where people did a lot of voluntary work in the sugarcane fields. Um, this is about um, collecting the coffee when it's ready. I have to say my very first agricultural work in Cuba was collecting coffee. I do have an anecdote about that. Um, there were two young Swedish women who had the summer before uh, been doing agricultural work in Israel. So I said, oh, that's very interesting. Uh, what do you find is different about the Cubans and the Israelis in this sense? And they said, well, you saw that we just took a break and the Cubans brought us little uh, pancitos and some coffee. And then they came back and asked if we wanted more coffee. And when we asked if it wasn't time to go back to work, they said, no, 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 rest for a while. Not in Israel. After you had half of your cup of coffee or half of anything, the Israelis came along and said, okay, okay, back to work. <laughs> Next. Next slide. Okay. Um, no, you're showing two slides at once rather than, but anyway, okay. Um, as long as people can see them. Um, the very famous um, poster by Rose Gard was done for the 10th anniversary of the Film Institute, which was one of, was really the first cultural institution established in Cuba and almost immediately started producing posters to advertise the films. And in a very different way than our posters, or our um, commercial ways of presenting what should be seen in the movie, because we emphasize the stars. What people were told at Ikaik was make a poster that says what the film is about. And so the Cuban film posters became a very different genre from the kind of posters that were made by graphic designers here. And well-known artists who had done posters before the revolution had to switch from showing only the famous stars to thinking about the movie and presenting something. Um, this is a famous poster by Felix Beltran to save on electricity. Uh, it won a major prize of uh, graphic design because it was so simply executed. Four letters that meant turn off the light when you leave the room. Okay, next. At the same time that I was coming to Cuba at the beginning, the Cubans had become very involved in international solidarity and graphic design was still the best way to promote that solidarity. The Vietnam posters, this one is by Rene Medeiros, became famous the world over. 
um, there was a time when just to own one of Madero's poster made you special. By the way, all of the all of these are not part of the center's collection, as um, Meg indicated. These are this particular one is, but we have a poster collection of about um, of several thousand posters in the center, but they are not necessarily all the ones that I'm showing you here. Um, let's go to the next one. But international solidarity was really an important part of the late 60s and early 70s. And graphic design um, came into its own, I think, at that time. This is Madero's traveled to Vietnam in 1969 and in 1971 and did a series of about 18 posters from each trip. Uh, which of course are incredibly collectible, but what was important about them is that they showed how the Vietnamese were fighting the United States, how they were surviving, what they were living through. And it made the Cubans and the Vietnamese grow very close during that period. Next. So all of the traditional art forms, I think probably photography and graphic design changed the most because before the revolution, uh, for example, the photographer Alberto Corda, who became very, very famous for his uh, portrait of Che Guevara, had only done fashion photography before the revolution. Now they turned to new models <laughs> and those models were Fidel, and Che, um, Jose Marti is a historical figure. Um, all of these kinds of, all of this art came to be used for new purposes. You can go on with the, with the slides now. I think that what you'll see is, as I say here, that this was something marvelously new with more depth and breadth and a more informed art. So the revolutionary years added a very special ingredient to the mix of what people were doing. For example, um, someone like Raul Martinez, you, you can put up a couple more of the, yes. Um, this is um, the photograph of Che Guevara made into an enormous poster by Nico, who was one of the Film Institute's most important graphic designers. And it fills an entire wall when you walk into the cultural center called Casa de las Americas. Next. On the other hand, somebody as modern as a young William Paris living in Cienfuegos could also make a Che Guevara, but his Che Guevara was basically naked, strong, and made of found materials. So a very a completely different, but still showing heroes of the revolution in different ways. Next. Raul Martinez, um, I, I think um, what I'm talking about here is that he is a perfect example of a transitional art figure because before the revolution, he was a well-known abstract painter and photographer. He had gone to the Chicago Institute for the Arts. Um, he was very well-known. And when the revolution came to power, Raul Martinez said, I realized I had to do something different because I wanted to reach the people. I wanted to reach the ordinary people, people who didn't know about art school, didn't know about painting, didn't know about graphic design, but I wanted to reach them somehow. So I completely changed the kind of art I was doing. Okay, next. This is uh, what Raul Martinez started to do was to do what in Cuba was called pop art, but a very different kind of pop art from what existed in the United States at the time. 
And what he did, what he does in this wonderful Cuba poster is to mix revolutionary heroes with ordinary workers in the society. Also, he has a self-portrait in the lower right-hand corner, that's Raul. Um, but he wanted, he wanted people to realize that everyone in a way is a hero in a revolution. And he wanted his art to reach everyone. He was a charming man and he regularly met with students at the art schools, especially when the Instituto Superior del Art opened. And he would tell them about classic painting. He would tell them about contemporary artwork. He would talk about mixed media. I sat in on many of those conversations. Now, he wasn't teaching at the time at ISA because he was gay and people hadn't gotten over it yet. Um, when Raul, Raul instead worked at the Book Institute designing book covers and made incredible popular art that was shown all over the city of Havana, uh, much of it by the local committees for the defense of the revolution, the CDRs. Next. Next. Here's an example of something that Raul did that was completely off the charts for most Cubans. Here you see Jose Marti, Fidel, Che, Camilo Cienfuegos, heroes of the revolution, but they don't look like the traditional macho men. Instead, Che has a rose on his lapel. Jose Marti is holding Las Rosas Blancas. The people are holding one another in friendship and love. And it was the kind of expression of revolutionary heroes that people hadn't seen before. Next. Here's another, another um, Raul Martinez did that for the Center for Cuban Studies and I think it was 1972. Um, we had hoped to make it into a poster, but we didn't have the money to make enough posters. But it was, again, his way of showing everyday Cubans and the Cuban flag within the revolution. It was a very, all of his images at that time were very powerful. Next. Next. Um, for example, this Che, um, which is one that's in my office, is a wonderful, wonderful, fiery, passionate expression of who Che Guevara was and who the painter was. Next. Next. Okay. Um, with the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 90s, It was almost impossible to get the kinds of artist materials that artists were accustomed to working with. There was no good canvas. There was no good paper. It was really very, very difficult. And one, well, there are a couple of, of movements, I would say, that grew out of the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 90s. One, was the growth of community organizations of artists, where artists banded together to share whatever they had in terms of materials. And the other was that artists started to use any kind of material they could find. Found materials and art became inextricably bound during the 90s, and I love it. You know, I think that one of the things that happened then was while most folk art communities continued to, to do painting because that was the only way they knew to express themselves, other artists such as Jose Fuster created a whole town. This is a whole town of Fuster. This is what you see at the left is an homage to the Cuban Five when they were arrested and put in prison in the United States for 
a long time. When they came out, one of the first places they went was to see Fuster's homage to them. The next one. Next, oh, the, and you can run a few of them. These are a few of the paintings that Fuster has done to accompany the town he built. The town is Hymenitas. It's about a half hour outside of, outside of Havana. And even though Fuster went to a school for art teachers, he did not study art per se. And so he's kind of considered a folk artist, which he isn't really, but he's made himself into a folk figure. <laughs> the, the town of Hymenitis, which he restructured, has um, his art on roofs, on the side of buildings. The first, the first um, person he asked if he could paint the side of their home was in fact the, um, the local doctor, because in Cuba, there is a doctor in every neighborhood, a doctor and a nurse. And he asked the local doctor's office if he could paint on the side of it to encourage other homeowners to let him paint. And it worked. And so dozens of people in Hymenitas have Fuster painted on the side of their home or in the front or on their front doors. Um, and many have compared Fuster's work to Gaudi, but he hadn't really seen Gaudi at that time. <laughs> and his work is, is very Cuban, it's, um, but he was interested in teaching children mostly about art and he thought this was a good way to do it. So it became a community where children and adults come to explore a different kind of art, okay? Next. And one of the things that was um, best about what the revolution brought to Cuban artists was giving voice and value to the importance of Cuba's African heritage. Before the revolution, a lot of Afro-Cuba religion was considered something that was not to be seen in good salons, whether it be art or community. And one of the things that has come from the revolution is the strengthening of the Afro-Cuban culture. Next. Manuel Mendive um, is a well-trained artist, even though he's often called a folk artist, a self-taught artist, he is not. Um, in fact, I think he won his first art award at the age of 11, and he's very well trained, but he's also a santero, a priest of the religion Santeria, and all of his artwork is infused with his religion. Much of his art is also, can also be seen in, in dances, in theater works, he paints the human body. Um, I've never forgotten the shock of members of my family when we were on a cross country trip in Cuba, we stopped to visit Mendive and he was in the process of painting a naked man. And my family loved it. The Cuban bus driver couldn't deal with it and had to leave and go to his bus and sit until the, our visit was over. Next. This is the most recent um, painting we have by Mendive. It's actually a serigraph, but obviously started out as a painting. Um, and it's one of the few paintings he is doing because right now he is working on sculpture for the most part. Um, and much of his art, as I said, revolves around Afro-Cuban culture, Santeria, and he, his art, is known world over for that emphasis. Next. This is an artwork by Belkis Ayon, another well-known painter who delved very deeply into Afro-Cuban religion, but not Santeria. 
she was very uh, concerned with the Abaqua religion. She was concerned with religions which were, which did not permit women to be part of the tribe. Um, she was very distressed by that. She was attracted to the religion and yet she was not able to be part of it. Um, when she was very young, she committed suicide and her loss was enormous to the artistic community. There was a wonderful show of Belkis Ayon art at um, El Museo del Barrio, um, hace dos años, I think I lose, I lose time with the, with the pandemic. It was two or three years ago. Um, and it was also shown in a major Los Angeles museum and has gone around the world now. Next. Um, this is the work of uh, a self-taught artist who also had some training. Um, this is Alberto Casado, who when he moved into his home, in Guanabacoa, which is known as a kind of Santeria town just outside of Havana. When he moved into his home, he found a little, uh, a small folk art painting. Um, and it intrigued him because the painting was done by painting on glass on the reverse side of the glass. And he decided to adapt that technique to his own artwork. So all of this that you see, what you see here was painted in reverse on the glass and then tinfoil was crumpled up and put behind it. And it's a folk art technique that lives on, I would say in large part because of Alberto Casado. Next. This, this painting is done by uh, Jose Garcia Montebravo of Cienfuegos and incorporates lines from a Nicolas Guillén poem, um, a very probably Cuba's most famous poet. And these are the people that Monte Bravo found the most interesting in his town. Uh, Monte Bravo himself was white and did not face the kind of uh, uh, attitude, I would say, of some people in the United States who we have a, a current example where a good friend and a very good artist who always worked in Afro-Cubania brought his art to um, an artist meeting in New Jersey, which included many, uh, many Cuban artist exiles. And almost as one, they exclaimed to him, but you're white. You shouldn't be doing Afro-Cuban art. And he said, in Cuba, we're all black, but he hasn't, he hasn't been able to continue painting from his tradition. And it's, it's really sad. Um, okay, go on. What's the next one? Oh, this is done by Choco, Eduardo Roca who signs his work Choco because he's very chocolate, very black. Uh, his name is Eduardo Roca and he and Nelson Valdez were among the first graduates from the Instituto Superior del Arte and went almost immediately to Angola to teach students in Angola, uh, painting, drawing, printmaking, which is what they were mostly doing at that time. Um, and came back with new ideas about how to show the history of Afro-Cubans in, inside Cuba. Next. Obviously the Cuban revolution had a profound effect on the lives and work of women artists. Um, the revolution did create an atmosphere in which exploring their liberation as women and contemporary artists became part of the natural landscape. There are so many good women artists. In fact, currently we have on exhibit at the Cuban art space, a show of Cuban women artists that we started on International Women's Day and have kept up because so many people have found it interesting. Um, and many, many contemporary artists 
are women. Um, I think the number of women artists grew exponentially because of the opening of a major art school in Havana. And most of the well-known artists who are trained artists have graduated from ESA. Um, I've mentioned just a few. Alicia Leal was a student at uh, another art school, but and Marta Maria Perez Bravo, but the more recent ones like Cyrenaica, Mabel, Glenda Leon, Tanya, uh, were graduates of ESA. Next. This is Mabel Poblet, uh, who was one of the earliest women artists that I came in contact with. She was 17 at the time and living in Cienfuegos and had just started her career. And it was a very personal art. Everything that she painted or drew was about herself, about how she felt, about how she thought. And I think this was a new, something new for Cubans to look at art as something so personal, so revealing of what they felt and somehow putting it together in their art. Next. This is Alicia Leal. Alicia, as I said, is a trained artist, but she often works in the folk art manner. And um, much of her work has to do with the fight against sexism, with the importance of Cuban women demonstrating that they are strong, that they are beautiful, that they can get their way through the world. Next. This is Marta Maria Perez Bravo, who is a very well-known photographer and graphic designer. And she was, she made this series of, I think nine photographs and prints uh, when she was pregnant with twins. And she wanted to let the world know that it was not easy, that she wasn't particularly happy. She felt blinded, she felt blindsided. Um, there's one in the series where she is holding a large knife to her stomach. It was a very strong series, um, but she was very frank with how she felt and her conflict over becoming a mother as well as a wife and an artist. Next. This is... Um, it's, that's not my name on there. That is the name of the artist. <laughs> Sandra, huh, whose name just went out of my mind, out of my head. Sandra Ceballos um, is another well-known artist who confronted the art establishment by painting the walls of her home with messages to the government. And inside the home, inside her home, by showing artists who were considered not quite with the revolution or their art was not quite with the revolution. Um, I particularly love this because it says Sandra and it's a cat, which, and I love cats. So Sandra gave that to me and it's a beautiful print. Next. This is Serenaika Moreira, who is the daughter of Alicia Leal's husband, Juan Moreira, a very well-known uh, Cuban artist who was a professor at the art school where Alicia went, not her professor. Uh, they did marry and he had been married before and Serenaika has become a very well-known artist um, and photographer, printmaker. She, like many, Cuban artist indulges in all kinds of art, whether it's a print, whether it's painting, whether it's drawing, watercolor, found objects, she does everything. This is a, a photograph I particularly like of her. Next. next. This is Elsa Mora. Um, Elsa uh, came to um, Havana as uh, an 18, 19 year old beginning to study. Um, 
became very well known for her artwork. A woman who worked constantly, so constantly that when I brought um, a reviewer from the New York Times, she said, that woman is going to have a nervous breakdown. She works too hard. She makes too much. Um, you'll be glad to know that Elsa Mora has never had a nervous breakdown. Uh, she is now um, living near Woodstock and um, with her American producer husband who fell in love with her artwork in Chicago and sought her out in Havana. <laughs> um, and she um, does a lot of work with the Museum of Modern Art. She does a lot of work with paper cuttings and all of it she learned within the revolutionary context in Cuba. Next. This is another Elsa Mora. We have several of her works up in our current show, including handmade books that she made of the five senses. Next. This is Sandra Dooley, who's a folk artist, self-taught. She lives in um, Santa Fe, just outside of Havana, the next town after Jaimenitas, where Fuster has made his, his town. And Sandra Dooley started out as an English teacher. She didn't like teaching. And she painted some Easter eggs one, one day for her students and decided she liked painting. And so she took up painting. This is Sandra with one of, in one of her uh, collages uh, flying over the city. Next. Rocio Garcia is one of the most interesting women artists. Um, show, you can show her the next, the next works. There are several works of hers that will come up next, I hope. <laughs> This was from a, a show called The Wolf in the, in the Human Being and consisted mainly of wolves being very um, angry and tough toward the women. But I thought this one looked a little bit like a Valentine, so I got it. Next. 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 This is in, Rocio did a series in the bar of sailors in the bar and their rough ways. Next. This is one that she did of someone obviously having what could only be called an orgasm along the Malacone. It's quite a wonderful painting. Next. And this was one she did as a small serigraph for a show in Havana so that everyone could walk away with something. Next. I think that I mentioned before the importance of found materials that came to artists after the 90s. Next. And some of the, this is by Abel Barosa. It's a wooden, coffee truck. Next. I know I'm taking too much time, so I'm trying to rush. No, rush. <laughs> okay. Um, Over a half an hour. Oh, no, this was, this is by, um, this was done with parts of the old Chrysler and Plymouth and put together by um, Kadir Lopez, who began to use all kinds of found materials. He especially liked old signs. Um, and so you'll see that a lot of his work has old US brands because they still exist. Not so much anymore. He also started a whole movement of neon in Havana and has helped to restore many of the old neon signs in Havana. Many of them connected, of course, with movie theaters. Next. Um, this is a, an outsider artist named Waya Cohn, who's now in his 90s and still going strong. But this was the first piece I bought from him in the early 1990s. And I was very excited to learn that the cow in the center was, everything there was made out of soap. I naturally expected it to 
collapse after a few years. Well, I still have it. The soapstone is still there. It's in perfect condition. Next. And this was from a show we did of in Los Angeles of mainly works of art that were made with found materials. Here you see an artist who, Ernesto Rancano, who recently died, who found a whole typewriter. <laughs> and that is that became his art, Who Wrote My Life. Next. This is one of my favorite pieces from Yoel Hover in, um, in Camagüey. He and his wife, Ileana, both artists. Um, but what he found to make art out of was Bucanero beer cans. And he made a John Lennon, he made a Fidel, he made a Jose Marti, and he made this, the Mona Lisa. I love the Mona Lisa, and we still have in, in our collection, the Fidel and Jose Marti. The John Lennon went very quickly. <laughs> Next. And this is one from an artist in, in Trinidad um, who everything he makes is out of found materials. And he especially likes to make, um, Carlos likes to make Fidel's. This doesn't happen to be a Fidel, but we have probably 10 or 15 Fidel's made out of pieces of wood. Made, uh, one Fidel is in a frying pan. Another Fidel is all white and sits on a stool. Um, but everything that he uses is found material. Next. Ibrahim Miranda is a very sophisticated artist who, when he was at ISA, started to make paintings on top of maps. Uh, now, that was, again, the special period. The Soviet Union had collapsed. There were no, <laughs> there were no easily, there wasn't a lot of canvas. There wasn't a lot of good paper. Why not use old maps? So Ibrahim started using maps to put his maps or his non-maps on top of maps. And I think, I think his, his um, artwork is beautiful because underneath there are maps of Cuba. Yes, continue. Next. <laughs> I wanna talk a little bit about folk art um, to close it up because when we opened the Cuban art space, Nobody cared about folk art, either in Cuba or in the United States. Because the Cubans were very, very proud of their trained artists and very proud of their tradition of good art schools and of their new art school, which Angela talked about in terms of its architecture. So people did not want to promote folk art. Folk art was considered what people did before who didn't couldn't afford to have any training. When we went there in the mid 90s on our first artist trip, art trip, uh, we went because Olga Hershorn, the widow of the Hershorn Museum owner, um, wanted to know about Cuban art. And so we put together a group of 38 people who wanted to know about Cuban art and we traveled across the country for the first time looking specifically for art. When I went to the major art critic in Havana and said, can you give me the name of artists outside of Havana? He said, well, you know, it's really difficult. We don't really have that much to do with art outside of Havana. And I said, can you give me the name of one artist in each city or town? And he said, I think I can do that. And he did. And as a result, you know, you only have to know one artist in a community in Cuba and soon you know 20 or 30. So that's what we did. Next, um, we 
drove across the, the country looking for all kinds of art. This was one of the first piece of folk art that I knew about. Antonia Aides, who was a great, a great painter. Um, and we'll see something of hers at the very end because I, I wanted to mention it earlier, but didn't have a chance. There have been, of course, lots of conflicts between artists and uh, the Ministry of Culture, the government, whoever was in charge of whatever at the time. Um, but that is not what we're concentrating on. But one thing that was very interesting was the first time that Antonia Aides uh, painted an image of Fidel Castro, only Fidel Castro was absent. All that was there was his microphones. And the Museum of Fine Arts in Cuba said, we can't show this. And it went to the basement. And Antonia was very upset about that. She lived in a popular neighborhood in Havana. And she decided with a couple of good friends of hers who were working to teach art, uh, mainly with not paint, but medicines. <laughs> Uh, she decided, she said, I can teach paper mache. And she, she started a paper mache movement in Cuba. And this mask was done by one of her pupils, uh, probably mentally disturbed, but a wonderful artist who lived across the street from her. And he did this mask, which most artists in Cuba do not make masks. That is not something you'll find in Cuba. You'll find it in Africa. You will not find masks in Cuba. So Papo's masks were very unusual. Next. And he made this beautiful butterfly for me, which I just love. You know, it's an incredible work of art made of paper mache. And thanks to Antonia Aides, he made hundreds of beautiful pieces of paper mache, as did other people. And she opened a small paper mache museum in her neighborhood, which you can visit if you go to Havana. Next. Grupo Bayate was the first um, folk art collective that we discovered. It opened in, Grupo Bayate started in 1994. Our trip, our visit, came in 1995. Um, you can show another one. Next, yes. Um, Isabel de las Mercedes was also, oh, wait. Oh, that's okay, leave that one. Um, this is one of the artists of El Grupo Bayate, um, Roberto Torres Lameda, uh, was a truck driver, um, still drove a truck in the 90s, and until he retired uh, in his 60s. But he painted, look at the detail. And this, this is one of mine and it's called um, El Mejor Amigo. And so I asked Roberto because we always know that a dog is man's best friend, right? So here's this woman walking along with her little dog behind her. And I said, so who is El Mejor Amigo? And Roberto said, her book, of course. So I love that. I shared that with my sister Mimi who loved books too. <laughs> we hope they don't totally disappear. Next. This one was done by a folk artist in Cienfuegos who lived outside of Cienfuegos. And I put it in not because she lived in a folk art community, but because of the incredible difficulty she had to paint anything. She was completely paralyzed from her neck down and she painted with a paintbrush in her mouth. And this was one of the paintings I brought back when we visited Takimi. Next. This is also one of the great, um, the great folk artists, uh, Ruperto High Matamoros, 
who died um, in 2008 in his late or mid or late 90s. He did absolutely beautiful folk art. He was respected and he, one of his paintings, I think, was one of only three folk art paintings in the Museum of Fine Arts when I first started visiting it in the in the 80s and 90s. Folk art was really not recognized until much later. And even now, uh, very little folk art is in the National Museum. Um, can Could you go back to a former slide? Would that be possible? Before that before that. Yes, this is Isabel de las Mercedes, who was the other very famous folk artist besides uh, Matamoros. And she painted everything about her life. And that's what I love about folk art. You learn about the communities, you learn about their families, you learn how they think about things, what they feel about the world around them. And she, one of her, uh, a whole series of paintings she did was when the Pope first visited Cuba. And she painted the Pope, the churches, the people going and had all kinds of writing across the painting um, because she loved the Pope, she loved the Catholic church and she wanted to express it as she felt it. And that's what I find so attractive about the folk art. Uh, one one back after, before this too. Yes, um, this is by um, Magnolia Betancourt, who is not part of Grupo Bayate, but shows with them because Grupo Bayate lives in a tiny village. Well, not so tiny. It's the same size as the town I grew up in Iowa, thirty thousand, but it's a small village without even a hotel. And all of the artists in Grupo Bayate live in Meya. But Magnolia lives in Moa, which is the nickel mining town of Cuba. And she brings her art so that she can be shown with Grupo Bayate. There was, um, I first met Magnolia when I was asked to be a judge of a folk art contest in Santiago. Of course, I assumed that someone would win from Grupo Bayate, right? They were the ones everyone knew about. And there was this painting by Magnolia and I had to give it first prize because I think her work, she now does mainly the pointillism that takes an enormous amount of time for each painting. You can go on now to the ones that come after the one we went back from, the next one. This was um, the painting by, I, I'm concluding now <laughs> because I just wanted to tell you that I did manage to convince the powers that be that folk art should be included in their annual contests and that they should send the people from the Museum of Fine Arts, not only to see fine artists, but also to see folk artists to participate in the annual, um, the annual shows that are awarded prizes. And in fact, I convinced them to show one of um, the folk artists from El Grupo Bayate who ended up winning third prize. They didn't really want to show a, folk, a piece of folk art, but after he won third prize, they decided folk art could be permitted into the, <laughs> the annual shows. Uh, this is the painting that I talked about earlier. Um, with no Fidel, that's the microphone. You'll be happy to know that it is now in a privileged space in the Museum of Fine Arts. It is no longer considered wrong to show it. It's not in the basement. It has been on display for at least 15 or 20 years now. Next, I just wanted to end with a few of the there, there are so many artists in Cuba, I can't talk about them all. Um, this was done for a show on Che and Marilyn Monroe, which led everyone 
who came to the show to ask, oh, did they know one another? <laughs> I said, no, they didn't know one another. They lived in the same space and time. And the artist, um, the artist from Cienfuegos, Adrian, thought it would be interesting to explore the different kind of pop cultures that existed in the United States and Cuba at that time while the United States has kept its 60 year embargo against Cuba. Next. And this is by Jacqueline Brito, one of two sisters who use every kind of, of image, every kind of material. There are two sisters who live in Havana, one year apart, uh, who grew up to teach at the Instituto Superior del Arte and um, Yamalis, uh, one of the two sisters, this is by Jacqueline. Yamalis uh, is now the person in charge of the print shop, the very famous print shop in Old Havana. Next. This is Alberto Lescai, who is known primarily as a sculptor in Santiago, um, but he studied in Moscow for seven years which is where he learned sculpture, but he was a painter before that. He started painting as a child. And this is one of his paintings that uses also found materials, in this case, a quilt. Next. This is another of Lescai's. He's become very attracted to a kind of abstract art with horses or birds. Um, and at the same time, incorporating much of his study of Africa and the Africans who came to Cuba to build the Cuban nation. Next, if there is a next. <laughs> um, this is one of William Paris's. He did the Che that I showed you at the very beginning. Um, and this is one where William, who had started, um, going with Mabel, the young woman artist from Cienfuegos who was exploring her own identity. This made William, a much older and trained artist, think about his identity. And he started doing a series of works that built on his own identity. This was a work in which he showed his concern for having his own place to live. It is not easy for a young person, or in this case, mid thirties person, uh, to find a home in a country with enormous shortages. So these two works went together. They were about housing, about his home, and the rest of the works, he collected very heavy plastic bags in which he put inside the bags, things which meant the most to him. His grandmother's rosary was in a bag with religious things. The first drawing he ever did of the human figure at Isa was in another bag with other drawings, etc. Okay. Next, if there is a next, I think we're at, oh, yes. Okay, so since I haven't had a chance to, it was really impossible, but one of the things that interested me is that when Obama opened relations in 2014, and before that, just because he'd been elected and the Cubans hoped that there would be a change between the United States and Cuba, and many more people started traveling to Cuba because it was easier than under Obama, many of the artists, that we most admired changed radically the kind of art they did. And that art was the kind of art that you would see in New York or Paris or London. And so I have stopped my conversation with you at the point at which the Cuban artists became part of the metropolis and not the metropolis in Havana, but the metropolis in the world, because now they are judged and thought about 
not as revolutionary artists or artists who were affected by the revolution, though much of their art still does show that, but they are more concerned about relating to something outside of Cuba, I think. Um, this is a wonderful, a wonderful painting um, by, um, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, because the next one, they're, they're so similar. Um, one is by Luis Camejo and the other is by, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I'm sorry. Um, continue to the next one. It'll come to me. It'll come to me, yes. Um, yes, this is by Luis Camejo and the one before is by the artist whose name I can't remember at this moment. Um, but it, they both show the Malacón. They both show their desire to reach beyond Cuba. I think that work like this is a way of showing how much the art has changed and how much the artist has changed within the 60 years of revolution. But you know, it's a much longer, it's a much longer subject, a much more difficult one. I think there's one more by Alexander Arachea. One more slide. Yes. Um, <laughs> by Alexander Arachea, uh, which is a wonderful work, a wonderful work. Um, and uh, these last three um, works were the last three works in one of our annual calendars of Cuban art. Thank you very much for putting up with me. Don't move because you'll knock me down. Okay, I won't move. I haven't moved. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting on the desk. Let me come down and I have to thank everybody. Okay. And Can I? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here. Okay. And you again. Yoan <laughs> Capote. <laughs> I just thought of his name, Yoan Capote. A great artist. <laughs> okay. Ah. I was sitting on a desk behind Sandra, so I had to kind of jump down. And now we've come to the end. Uh, we've had to uh, people with us, Angela Rojas talking about trends in Cuban architecture, uh, which was brilliant, and Sandra Levinson talking about trends in the plastic arts, painting and whatnot, who was also remarkably brilliant. And I thank them both deeply uh, for joining us this evening to discuss trends in Cuban art. They have done a marvelous job and we're particularly thankful. And I'm also very appreciative to all of those who have come. I'm looking at the number and um, we will have on the 18th of April, another webinar focusing on music in Cuba and the export of music from Cuba over the past decades, uh, particularly to New York. And our two speakers will be Chris Washburn, who's the chair of the Department of Music at Columbia University. He is also a trombonist and the author of uh, several books, including Latin jazz and the other jazz. And um, he has been a practicing musician as well as a scholar for some time. And he will be joined by Ben Lapidus, who's an expert on the Cuban tray and the Cuban cuatro, two instruments, as well as numerous aspects of Cuban music 
particularly Afro-Cuban music, as well as other genres that have been tremendously successful, not only in Cuba, but also elsewhere. And so we come to the end and the end is a very, very warm thank you to Angela Rojas and to Sandra Levinson. And we're hoping that next year, Nancy Morejon will make it uh, here to New York to give some readings of her poetry and talk about literature in Cuba even more. And there's finally one very, very special thank you. And that's to Astrid Linden, who is our savior when it comes to technology, as you could see <laughs> from the things, even though she practiced with me beforehand, I couldn't follow her instructions at the end. So thank you very much, Astrid. Uh, thank you, Astrid. Yes. Thank you, thank you Astrid. And again, thank you to all of you who have attended. Hope to see you on April 18th. Sure. Good evening. Good evening. Oh God, are we done?